occasionally I am approached by secular atheist, secular humanist atheist scripture scholars and they're scripture scholars just to define what a scripture scholar is for all of you in this context so you understand. In this case, a scripture scholar is someone who has read about four verses of the Bible, but don't worry, they've watched a lot of TikTok videos. <laughs> they, they understand it all completely. And they'll, they'll come up to me and they'll, 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 they'll say something like this, you Christians, you pick and choose what you want to believe of the Bible because you, you will hold to these moral commands from the Old Testament, especially when it comes about things like marriage and family and human sexuality. Because you know, the church is obsessed with sex. I love it when, the, when the, someone who's secular tells me that the church is obsessed with sex. You know what I mean? It's great when the secular world says, church, you talk about sex too much. Anyway. And they'll say, you people, you follow all of those things, but you know, the Bible also says that you shouldn't wear blended fabrics, and it also says that you shouldn't eat bacon and you shouldn't eat shellfish. And Father, I saw you scarfing down some bacon-wrapped scallops. <laughs> Therefore, you're a hypocrite, and you're just picking and choosing. So after saying a prayer to whoever the patron saint against forced strangling is, I'd like to take an opportunity to teach a lesson. Because I've heard this argument so many times, and it's so baseless and so silly and so stupid. But if I've heard it a bunch of times, I imagine many of you have as well too. So let me explain to you. In the Old Testament, there is a difference between the moral law and the ceremonial law. So we heard the moral law given to us, the, the, the foundation of the moral law given to us in the first reading today, and the, and, and the Ten Commandments. Most of the Ten Commandments, by the way, you don't need divine revelation to understand them. You know, things like you shall not steal, you shall not kill, right? These are obvious societal goods and obvious virtuous things, so much to where the ancient Greeks would have called it natural law. It's law that St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans is written on our hearts. You know, you, you don't have to have a divine revelation to know that you shouldn't kill people. So it's not like we're saying, you know, okay, well, Jesus came and he abrogated all the moral laws of the Old Testament, so guess what? It's okay to kill people now. I mean, how, isn't that absurd? It's absurd to think something like that. But in the Old Testament, you also have the ceremonial laws. The moral law doesn't change. The moral law is unchanging. The ceremonial law has changed. Why? Because all of this was about preparing the people of God for the Messiah, preparing the people of God, Israel's people, for the coming of Jesus. And so Jesus fulfilled a lot of what the Old Testament prescribed, and therefore these things became unnecessary. And one is what we call the holiness code. Now, if I say the word holiness or holy to all of you, right away, we associate that with something religious, right? But the word holy, or the word in, in Hebrew is kadosh, it literally just means set apart. So like when we talk about a holy space or a sacred place, right? We always say the church is a sacred place. Why is the church sacred? Because it's set apart for things that are holy. That's why people all the time say, you know, well, Father, I don't get it. You know, nature is more beautiful than any church, which it is. Nature is created by God, which it is. So, you know, why can't we have our wedding on the beach? Well, because we want this done in a holy place, a place that is set apart for something sacred, not a place where animals do their business and people do God knows what, you know? Uh, a place that's holy, a place that's set aside. And so Israel was told that you're going to be holy. You're a holy nation. You're a nation that's set apart from everyone else. So you're going to be set apart in how you dress, in how you groom yourselves, and even in the food that you eat. Everything's set aside to show that you are holy. 
And of course, Jesus comes along and he fulfills that by saying, first of all, you're holy, you're holy because of me, because you've been baptized into my blood, you've been redeemed by my blood. That makes you holy and people will know this by the life that you live. And so Jesus not only didn't, didn't aggregate the moral law, in fact, if you remember, Jesus holds us to a higher moral standard. Two examples from the fifth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. You've heard it said to you, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, pray for those who persecute you. Forgive those who wrong you. That's a higher standard than was called for. Amen, amen, I say to you, in the time of Moses, you were permitted to write, a, a man was permitted to divorce his to divorce his wife, but I say to you, what God has joined together, no human being must divide. Jesus is calling us to a higher moral standard, not a less strict moral standard, and certainly things that are obviously, apparently, biologically, scientifically opposed to natural law, I don't have to spell it out for you, of course they're gonna be against God's law, because it goes against who we are by our human nature. The ceremonial laws, however, Jesus fulfilled. And in fact, the food thing is addressed really clearly in the Old Testament. Uh, Peter and Paul were arguing, arguing, arguing about this very point. Peter, for a long time, was insistent that converts to Christianity had to abide by all the old laws. And Paul said, no, this is not how it's supposed to be until they had a big council about it in the, in, in the first century, the, 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 the Council of Jerusalem, and uh, Peter had this vision where, you know, there were all kinds of animals, like nice juicy little piggies and, and other things that, that, uh, that a good Jewish boy couldn't eat. And the voice said to Peter, rise up, kill and eat, for nothing I've made is unclean. In other words, showing that Jesus had fulfilled all of these laws. I can imagine the joy of the apostles when they could have bacon for the first time. And thank God, too, because this means that all the ceremonies of the Old Covenant, we don't have to keep anymore. You know, for example, baptism replaced circumcision. Adult converts to Christianity are probably very thankful for that. Adult male converts, especially. Uh, we, didn't have to, we didn't have to be Jewish in order to be Christian because a lot of these things Jesus fulfilled, especially those laws that were associated with the sacrifice of the temple. Because Jesus Christ fulfilled all the sacrifices of the temple. That's why several times during Mass, we echo the words of St. John the Baptist by calling Jesus the Lamb of God. We don't call Jesus the Lamb of God because sheep are cute or because they're meek and they're mild. It wouldn't be like, you know, if the authors of the sacred scriptures were really cat people you know, you say, behold, the kitty cat of God. No, it's talking about the sacrifice that Jesus would make. Especially the Paschal sacrifice. Paschal means of or pertaining to Passover. So have you heard the word Paschal in church? It's Passover or Easter. Because in every other language, by the way, except for German and English, uh, Passover and Easter are the same thing. We call, we, we call the Christian Passover Easter. Uh, but, we, but we say Easter, which, by the way, also has nothing to do with the name of pagan German de deities either. But that's another sermon. So Jerusalem. Jesus is here in the temple. And first of all, John gives us a context clue about when it is. When, when, what, what time of year was it? It's Passover. What's going on the Passover? They're getting ready to slaughter those lambs. Now, Jerusalem... If you can imagine a combination of Rome, New York, and Washington, D.C., and modern-day Jerusalem all rolled into one, and that's what Jerusalem was to first-century Jews. It was the socio-economic, cultural, and religious center of their place. In other words, they got a lot of people going there, especially at the high times of the year. Now, the money changers in the temple and the people who sold the animals in the temple were necessary for its operation for a number of reasons. 
One of them being, if you're going to travel, uh, if you're going to travel from Jericho to Jerusalem to make a sacrifice, and you're going to carry a dove with you all the way on the back of an animal or all the way by foot, chances are by the time that dove gets to the temple, it's going to have a ruffled feather, it's going to have a bruise, it's going to have something wrong with it, which means that it would be an unacceptable sacrifice. So they had to sell the animals at the temple, because before your sacrifice was made, it would be inspected to see if this was suitable if it wasn't suitable, you'd have to buy another animal. So this is why they were there in order so that people could buy it. Uh, coincidentally, the same people that inspected the animals were also the ones that were selling uh, other animals. And so it's kind of like Disney World or, or, going to, or going to a baseball or football game. You know what I mean? They don't let you bring in food or drink from outside because they want you to pay $15 for, 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 for an eight ounce glass of beer on the inside. And, and, the, and, the, and the difference apparently was quite great. It was like a difference of four to 75 in, ter in terms of, of, of the price inside the temple. So scholars, and, and the money changers were also necessary because the Roman coins bared the image of, of who on it? Caesar, right? Caesar was worshiped as a god. Therefore, the coins themselves were a violation of the very first commandment. You shall not worship anyone besides God, and you shall not have graven images. So to bring images of a worshipped pagan god into the Jewish temple would be to profane, which is the opposite of sacred. So remember, sacred says set apart. Profane means ordinary, everyday. Profane doesn't just mean nasty words. You know, when we talk about profanity, really what that means is ordinary common language. And so it would profane God's temple to do that, so they had to exchange it for temple currency that didn't bear the image of Caesar on it. So when we have this incident of Jesus in the temple, Scripture scholars have different opinions about what's going on. One, and I think this is the one, the obvious interpretation that we grew up with is that there were clear abuses going on in the temple. Clearly people were being price gouged. Clearly it was not the place of worship as it could be, you know, because you had all these tourists showing up, probably wanting to go on temple tours. You probably had the secret inside temple tour that you had to pay more money. I don't know how that worked. Uh, all of these, they, they were, and so Jesus saw the abuses and he says, get out. Which, by the way, the next time someone asks you what would Jesus do, please remember that flipping over tables and chasing people with a whip is a viable option. <laughs> it's good for us to remember that, though, that our Jesus was not passive. He wasn't always meek and mild in the sense as we understand those words today. Jesus was fierce. He could be a force to be reckoned with when he saw abuses. So he says, you've made my father's house a marketplace. You're making money off these people. You're extorting them. Get out of here. Get out of here with your garbage. But also, the more deeper theological sense is because the money changers and the, and, and the people selling money were necessary to the operation of the temple, that the action of Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem was his way of declaring an end to the temple. That this would not be necessary anymore because he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He would be the Lamb of God. What does John the Baptist say about him just before this scene? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In St. John's Gospel, Jesus is crucified at the exact moment and hour that the Passover lambs are being killed. As blood and water flowed from the side of our Savior, blood and water was flowing from the side of the temple in Jerusalem as all those lambs were sacrificed and the, and the troths washed out with water. So Jesus is saying, the temple's over. And he makes it pretty clear. You tear it down, I'm going to build it up in three days. They were not happy about that. In fact, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel, that's the phrase that got him crucified. 
But he's talking about the temple of his body. So there's the theological and historical perspective on all of this, which comes down to us, the spiritual meaning. We're in this beautiful and blessed season of Lent. What secular attitudes, what worldly ways have invaded us as temples of the Holy Spirit? What sins are we still clinging to? What addictions do we need to be freed from? What attitudes do we need to let go of? What resentments do we need to cease? What behaviors do we need to amend? For all of those things, the Son of God wishes to come into, and like the mighty guy with the whip, chase them out, get them out of our lives, get them out of our hearts. That's why we have the sacraments available to us in such plentitude in this time. But to the second historical point in the interpretation of this, have I allowed the blood of Jesus to be sufficient in my life? Do I believe that God's grace is enough for me? Do I believe that I'm a beloved son, a beloved daughter of God? Have I accepted the fact that I've been made into a new creation? Have I accepted the fact that Jesus Christ is alone the way, the truth, and the life? So as we continue through this Lenten season, this time of prayer, fasting, and works of charity, and as we move into this Mass, let's allow Jesus Christ to be the it and all in our lives and in our hearts. Let's allow him to cleanse us of anything that's not of him, and let's accept him as the once and for all sacrifice for our salvation.